so this might you know be a more or less a shocking surprise but vfx uh, comes with its cliches and um, the movies are really different All, uh, every movie tries to be something else you know something new something um, kind of not seen before but a lot of times there is something which is a little bit different but there is a bunch of stuff which is uh, the tried and true stuff so uh, just like with music or with literature you always build something which is a little bit new and quite a lot of the old stuff and every next piece is something which uh, has been uh, which is building up on uh, the, the the great stuff that has come in before so because of that you know we have ended up doing quite a lot of things which are similar uh, through the through the you know months and years and we have, uh, it looks like it's a it's a good strategy to kind of build up some skills to do to deal with these with these cliches and this helps out a lot because they they happen so often so some of these cliches that we're going to be that, that that we are kind of going to focus now are, is the building destruction and environment destruction kind of uh, breaking ground and stuff like that is quite similar um there is probably only one different area which is that it has uh, some trees uh, and i think goran has done a really good job on showing up some some tree dynamics so which is really great but otherwise i think it's quite uh, similar uh, to to the building destruction there is some some more displacements happening and some uh, interesting shaders there um, but that's kind of a niche thing um, another uh, well-established cliche is the ground impact so often you you have stuff smashing into the ground and it has its own challenges and you know approaches and uh, if you guys want i could give you an um, a webinar about that because we have done plenty of these lately so you know while this thing is still fresh and of course, the other one is uh, the meteoric events. So something goes through the atmosphere, you know, it, it's emitting pieces, you know, it's burning, it's going towards the ground, often is uh, coupled with the ground impact uh, cliche. So um, uh, these are, I guess, one of the major uh, rigid body kind of focus ones. And there is some more like um, explosions and smokestacks and uh, interactions with oceans and splashing things in water which are more fluid like but we are not going to be dealing with this with these things for now um, we want to more focus on the rigid body uh, on the destruction kind of area so um, always we go through these four phases and you can see them here there is let me kind of bold these things So there is four phases of going through the effect. There is the planning, uh, there is the base simulations, the secondary simulations, and lighting. Um, each of them extremely important, and uh, each of them uh, being quite different. So uh, first we have uh, the planning. Um, and obviously, uh, this is the most important part, because if you start on the wrong foot, you know, everything is going much worse and much slower so um, a lot of times we deal with um, with concept art of the effects and we often um, get receive stuff from the client which is um, let me get back to the to my footage yeah so a lot of time a lot of times we receive concept from the client so let's say for example on a shot like uh, like this one uh, there was plenty of uh, of drawings about where things would go and eventually though things went in a very different direction but at least they we did have some something to to start with uh, so sometimes there is stuff in the previous uh, which is outlining basically where things would go in which direction how fast how much uh, they would take up from the screen space other times now you could get a person to draw some some more detailed effects which actually sets some mood and it's really helpful when it happens uh, but there's always some design um, you know in, in the least case there is some description which then takes a few meetings to uh, kind of get into into an actual design phase and you end up doing your first versions of your effects as actually a previous and kind of kind of a blocking phase and design to just establish the timing and the spacing um, when are things going to happen, how much they're going to cover, at what distance, what speed, all this kind of stuff. So uh, it makes 
much easier, you know, do, to do everything else afterwards because without that, you know, you you basically lost and you end up doing a lot of stuff. Um, uh, then after that um, come your assets. So you know, when you destroy stuff, you start with something that you have to destroy, and uh, it's extremely important that these things are in a good condition because. Um, they can kind of break your simulator if if you know things are if you miss something out out in there. Um, we do a quality check on the assets for things like UVs because the UVs need to to freeze when they go into a simulation, uh, which means that you can't really re UV stuff easily after they are into the simulation. Um, and uh, we tend to do more procedural work on things on models which are not yet finished because this also obviously happens and then do uh, like basically uh, setups which are easy to to uh, to tweak and to change you know they don't have a lot of manual work uh, and only when the, uh, the the assets get the green light only then uh, do a lot of you know manual cutting and uh, picking up out particles for different behaviors and stuff like that so UVs are really important, material IDs are also important. Uh, everything that you need to apply different materials uh, afterwards too needs to have its own material, material ID and it needs to have, um, uh, everything needs to have this multi-sub material when it goes into thin particles, it has, uh, covers all the slots. Um, so when you start and you are thinking, okay, let's try things out with a, with a simple shader override, sometimes this is a bit of a uh, you know bad idea because it covers some problems that you might want to to to, to consider and fix in advance. So this is quite important. Uh, the other thing is that very often there is not enough geometry in the uh, in the model that you get to create sufficient interest, and um, you could see, for example, in yeah again like in shot like this one. Um, the model that we got was quite simple, and it was it was quite difficult to make interesting stuff happen with it because it's you know basically this tower which is uh, solid on the inside, and the only thing interesting is the scaffolding on the outside. So we had to um, do stuff which is more interesting with the scaffolding and some some kind of a more art, interesting art, art directed breaking to get more detail in there. And this is especially true with buildings because you get often these models that are made by somebody who is um, making them for rendering and not for destruction. And it needs so much more stuff in, in inside on the inside uh, in, in, a, in a model that you're going to use for a sim than the one that you use for render. So these things, yeah, need to be checked out quite quite in advance. Sometimes you can fix that, you know, by just adding things in. in we have done a lot of that, you know, just have this kind of layers of, of, of kind of scaffolding and meshing inside just to create some 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 interlinked uh, structure uh, and put in some furniture and you know debris that you can kit bash from somewhere. Uh, but you know, it's really the best when the model is being designed with uh, dynamics in mind. So we prefer we and we actually do our own models. So it's much better. Um, now, of course, you need to have your cameras and the shot ranges uh, set out and your plates. Uh, this should be should go in here. Uh, it's very important. So you know, you know when the shot starts, when the shot ends. You know, the, the camera and the tracking are in the correct in the correct place. And you have when you have animated stuff, like let's say there is a character moving or uh, there is some kind of a big prop that that you need to react to and so on. Make sure that you have pre-roll animation uh, because you'll need to do stuff before the event happens. And sometimes this can be. Kind of avoid it if you if you miss pre-roll animation you could just extend the keyframes to go linearly uh, but that's not always you know something which works you know sometimes you get the baked animation that is uh, starting with uh, from a standstill or sometimes the, um, the 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 prop did something very different in the shot before which needs to be present in the next shot so you know make sure you have some pre-roll animation that's uh, uh, an advice that you know it's it, it's really wise to 
to follow and it's good it's a good idea to check in advance before you start your your work so then when your when your planning stage is done then your then is the base simulation stage and um, that's like one of the reasons that that I really wanted to to show you this kind of this this thing that that, that we discussed already kind of in a in the in the earlier a couple of minutes uh, because that's basically our base simulation and this is the most important part of um, of your effect and it's the most art direction intense uh, place that you're going to be at in your project so here it win you you win out if you have these quick setups that you can show to the director often and get a lock off on all the stuff that happens so basically you need to say okay there's going to be a bunch of events that would that will happen i think i have some let's say some some earlier previews and uh, just even you know kind of what are the elements that are going to take part of this we're going to have the the bigger stuff the smaller stuff i'm going to have windows exploding um are some some pieces um, going to be breaking is it important for example like to have certain props breaking and some certain things flying away it's really important to get all of these things straight early on and um at this stage we have done so many versions i think you know that was more than a couple of dozen versions just early on um trying to establish kind of how we would do how we would make the most interest out of the shot so there is this missiles coming in uh, do we want to have you know maybe just like one explosion that is going to shatter the whole building but then the whole building feels a bit too weak and then we have another missile but uh, you know another explosion but what is this explosion going to do if we just have it like on the inside and contained, then we don't see anything from it. It doesn't look interesting. So eventually we decided, okay, let's make a, a second explosion that you can see here, you know, happening out there on the side. So we can rip out the face of the building. And this would also enable us to get some interesting water interaction, maybe opportunities to just make stuff that's, that's like a bit more exciting. And this look very, very rough but they are um, they are they are extreme, the most important uh, area so you can see in this preview which is like already version 20th um, i've shown you like version two and then which you can see you know there's there's plenty of stuff but there is still um things which are missing um and just like ideas are different um, then i showed you version five then this is version 12 that has you know the more pronounced explosion here on the side version 20 has the timing much more heavy so we figured that the that to make it feel big and um building like our our speeds were too fast so we slowed down significantly um everything and then it started be, uh, being less interesting so we we then started throwing it farther up the air and we just did these things with some geometry that we pushed from from underneath um, just have a point and a bunch of spheres um, use them as neutron in the shape collision and uh, push them up and eventually kill them after a few frames uh, you want to be careful so they don't live too long so you see kind of things colliding with something invisible uh, but you see there is a lot of problems with these early shots like with these early versions there's uh, things are popping in and out and uh, collisions are being a bit too stiff all this kind of stuff uh, so eventually we start thinking about how this side explosion is gonna how big it's gonna be how it's gonna affect the rest of the building and you can see that in the in the earlier versions it's a bit you know it happens around the the area but then it kind of disappear it, it it dissolves so we thought okay that's a bit looks a bit a bit isolated and a bit disconnected from the rest so we start testing things out with um having this uh, explosion effect more of, of the house and here the colors are just the groups that we move the particles through so you know in the beginning there is um the usually all most of our particles besides ground and so on are active in their active state but they get a lot of friction so they so they um 
they active they, they become uh, they, they lose that friction after they get a, a lot of velocity and this way you hit them with something very heavy and the uh, ones that are like near the collision they speed up and they kind of really get released from this friction and you know they become your the flying chunks but then the ones which are near the, the, the that smash they do move a little bit to the side and they they get affected uh, they don't sit like neutron you know things which don't belong to the same world they do get affected by the by the push but that friction that big friction freak friction that is applied to them is uh, kind of uh, pulling them in place so they 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 feel like they are resilient and they uh, they would stand the, the the force because most of the force is directed to the center of the of the event so with uh, kind of tweaking the thresholds like uh, uh, for this activation at what speed uh, this friction gets you know uh, turned off and what is the uh, amount of, the, of, the, of that friction you get different like amounts of stiffness uh, and this is the easiest way I, I guess to have these things happening um, there there is uh, there are ways that we use which are a bit more elaborate like using for example um, uh, kind of a cage which which has joints and it has shape collision uh, between these two joints uh, or nowadays actually the uh, the flow solver is like the SPH solver is uh, is really nice because you can have something which is quite quite interestingly stiff and and deforming. So we use this as a, a cage to kind of get, get give us this this well this huge structure interconnectedness soft um, bouncy steel you know. Um, things because you always want to have that and not just house of cards it doesn't look like a structure but yeah here are some more tests of kind of how how this uh, can affect in a wider area and then eventually we get to adding some secondary so how much of these things is going to be what is going to be the uh, the distribution of the sizes how much of them should stay on the edges and make the edge richer and how much of them should get released all this kind of stuff also get explored um, so um, yeah something which I um, maybe didn't mention is that it really helps to have very well the different versions because the director wants to choose, want to choose between things which are significantly very different and this gives them impression that you have covered a lot of ground that is not just you know a couple of uh, things which are almost the same so um, you need to have a big spectrum like a lot of things have been presented and we have gone you know to the ends of the earth and we've picked up only the, the best thing so this is uh, important and i did talk about uh, structure and internal connectivity because um, this from my experience is what really sells the scale and the life uh, of your your structure um, it only is interesting when things pull together. We had a structural engineer coming into Battleship and giving us a lecture about how things are built and how they come down. And um, it is in Bulgarian, so I think, you know, not maybe very useful to you guys, but I might uh, do a resume of it and put it online. I think this is this would be, this would be quite, quite interesting. Or we can invite uh, Stoyan again to have some kind of a an interview and he can give us a presentation in English. This would be actually a good idea. I'm gonna write this down. Let me actually do write this down. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll do it later. Um, so then after the base simulation, everything is settled in. Oh, actually I have a, let me see. I have something in here in DP that, you know, as I said, I can't really show I don't really even want to show these big setups because you know it's it's messy and it's slow and uh, not something I had a lot of time to clean up. But um, I just wanted to show you how kind of it works and how simple it actually is. You know? And um, that's pretty much what you see. Um, things are coming in inside TP. And then, um, as I said, there is a bunch of things which are acting as these kickers, so objects which are smashing into the stuff which is uh, active but with a lot of friction uh, there is the you see that there is this uh, friction lots of friction groups that um, when <laughs> for example here it's like uh, 
when the uh, the particle goes below some 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 velocity, it gets more friction. Otherwise, it has gravity. So, you know, if you have <laughs> things shooting upwards, and only at some point you need to, you want to come uh, to tell them to fall down. In the in these early stages, when you kind of sculpt and design your simulation, you do a lot of this kind of stuff uh, because you want to to influence it and to influence it to kind of sculpt it and to, to put, put things in exactly the right place and. We tend to do these things with forces and frictions just because they are so soft. If you do something with like overriding velocity and hitting things with neutrons, this is this is quite harsh and you can always you can always see kind of that everything happens very suddenly and it doesn't have this weight and inertia and slowness. But when you make it with forces and with frictions, um, everything is uh, has, has some speed up and uh, uh, like speed goes up and down, everything is soft and you can tweak how much Know, this softness happens um, so that's that's how we usually do this kind of stuff and um, yeah you can see that there is plenty of uh, hitting things with very hard objects which is you know when you have like a very explosive event and you don't really care about the ramps, ramps up uh, the, the ramps of speed you know up and down um, so we do this this thing for explosions but we sculpt then the behavior with forces and frictions um, so yeah, it's uh, it's really simple. Um, there is this um, timing events that also happen a lot. So we just make a bunch of uh, uh, copies of something that we assign different time interval to, and um, we create these beats, which are important because it is uh, one of the one of the most important things in you know the design of the shot is when things happen, and we want to have these very specific beats, and directors are usually quite. Um, accurate about these things, you know, this frame something needs to happen and then this frame. So you know, just like simple simple time intervals that activate things which are near something. So for example, here you, can, you have like, um, there is some node which which uh, we get distance to and at when this uh, frame happens, only the uh, glass which is near this node gets activated and then this activation makes it uh, go to, um, to, to to some group which uh, gets the forces that exploded applied and then at another time uh, another area of the building gets the same treatment so yeah this uh, simple stuff that allows us to to do quite a lot of uh, uh, design design work otherwise yeah you have the USC everything is very simple um, there is a bunch of copies of almost the same setup for all the places where this happens and we do that quite often that we create something for one area like let's say here there is stuff for the building and then there here stuff there's uh, that stuff for the, for the roof of the building so this just allows us to kind of reuse the same thing and um, tweak the timings and the, the uh, emitters of, of stuff and then have the, the rest pretty much behave the same there's a bunch of things which are different, obviously. So the, this is the starting point, you know, copying things is the starting point. Uh, but there are just some areas which need extra, some extra touch. For example, here we have attached a bunch of fragments to the edges because they are, they are flying so uh, big and wide and you can see the, you know, the Voronoi shapes or even if you do uh, shape noise them, nothing replaces just adding a bunch of, you know, wire and cables and like this rebar and, uh, eaten up concrete chunks on the edges. That's what we do most of the time. Uh, and we have even like added extra um, volume breakers on the edges so they get a bit shattered more. Uh, and stuff gets killed because sometimes it just goes out of the region of interest or uh, out of times like certain particle is a bit offending that we usually do after the cache. That's a bit strange here. I'm not sure. So, uh, that's what happens with base simulations. Um, then these are nice, but the, the I guess Cedar is going to take care of these. These are nice, but they are they are not as juicy. So if you compare, let's say, if you compare uh, something like. Uh, Let's say this maybe, this has some secondaries. 
uh, with something like this, obviously, you know, these edges are not going to fly and you need much, much more stuff in here. Uh, so we treat this base simulation as, you know, the kind of the, the skeleton of uh, what's happening. And then we flesh out around this skeleton with a lot of stuff. And uh, this stuff is pretty much kind of a big portion of what you see. And uh, when it behaves, behaves correctly, it really is key to kind of adding this richness and juiciness and everything to your shot. So the key part is that these things are a lot, there's a lot of these things. Uh, when you're talking about debris. So there's a bunch of secondaries. Um, um, basically, some of them are geometry, some of them are volumetrics. Um, so when, when the stuff is geometry, there is just like a lot of them. And you know, there's like tens of thousands, um, millions uh, in this uh, vicinity. So you need to plan wisely so you can fit them in memory. Uh, and basically, and this is, is uh, going in the same direction with uh, actually giving lighting people a lot of control on, on, on them because unlike the base simulation which eventually goes to lighting as we're gonna I'll talk, talk about a little bit later kind of as it is the um, the, the secondaries uh, they need so much uh, lighting work and you know there's just a lot of opportunity there so uh, we are gonna discuss about you know the point cloud approach um, in a second uh, but then first, uh, how we emit these. So uh, kind of we emit probably three major types. Uh, one of them is the splashing, which happens when something, uh, when some, some threshold is crossed. So let's say uh, I'll very often when some velocity threshold is crossed. So when something starts moving, then you get a splash of, of, of debris, which, which creates a cloud around this, uh, this area of interest and, you know, enriches it. Uh, let me see here. I'm sure there's some of that stuff. So, <clears throat> so there is a, a part here, and you can see um, that there is some threshold of uh, velocity and size because often we don't really want to emit from the super tiny, um, and uh, we often connect the size and the velocity to the rate just because we want to kind of have the same the controllable density. Um, otherwise, if you have something very big and emit and, and something quite small and emit the same amount, they will have different density in, in space and you want to have kind of controllable consistent density. So this is basically the splash, uh, the splash emission type. Um, then we have a stream emission type. Um, these streams usually start when some event, uh, when some threshold gets crossed. But then instead of uh, a single emission, we, th there is a continuous emission. So obviously, yeah, this one is more of, the, of, this, of this type. Um, we use these for more like slower moving things that we want to continuously um, enrich the edges of things with secondaries, with debris. Um, and a lot of times these things fall because of gravity and because of collisions with other things. So, you know, it's nice that they fly around, but you want to have some, plenty of them kind of uh, lining up a, a certain area where the uh, structure happens. So you emit them with uh, like over time continuously. And obviously when something stops, you don't want them to keep um, running off. So then you stop it with a velocity threshold. Um, so um, I, would, I, would, I would say the last one is the following type emissions of secondaries. And these are just uh, particles which sit there on the edge and they do um, a reference and peer touch and just their only function is to, uh, to create, to, to get some meshes uh, on them and which creates like an interesting edge. So you can see here in the roof, as I said, we have um, these peer touched um, extra particles which uh, whose, uh, you know, function is to just do that um, as the particle gets fragmented and is a bit bigger because you don't really want to do this on the smaller on the smaller guys you just emit a bunch of particles on it and you reference them so they can later follow the 
current particle, it just happens all the time. Um, it's also something which is smart in here, which I'm not, not sure why we haven't uh, connected, to, to just connect the size to the, um, to the shot. Uh, so you can have a, uh, like, a, again, a consistent density and cover the, the areas nicely. You don't want to have too many kind of naked areas. Um, so then these things need to actually do something interesting because, you know, if you again look here, uh, if, if stuff is um, just flying off into space, let me see, I, we have an example, I think, here in this earlier version. Um, so you can see here that some of them, no, it wasn't here, let me see. This stuff is colliding already. Even maybe in the, in the real, like even here, yeah. Um, if you if you look at the glass, for example, in here, oops, sorry. At the glassy stuff in here, you can see that they just they just leave. So when you don't have any collision and things just leave, you don't have opportunities to make things kind of create this exciting, interesting soup. Everything is just detached. So the good thing about TP is that it has this bunch of uh, interesting solvers which we can use to make things interact and do things a little bit more interesting. Uh, so we use basically two things. For the bigger ones, we use bullet. So you can see when we emit these guys, we give them some um, bullet rigid body uh, properties. And at the end of the secondaries, there is a, there is a bullet physics node. So what, is, what this guy does is that it, it has um, the main simulation as a deflector and it has the secondaries as the, the particles participating in the collision. So uh, this is nice because it allows us to keep the same simulation as we have at the base. So everything is gonna be in the same uh, style as it was when it was approved. And it's gonna have, um, it's gonna add a bunch of uh, things which are gonna be colliding and so on. With, the, with this base simulation. So um, bullet is nice and fast, but you know, it's fast with like a few, a few thousand particles. It's not something that we use when we need you know, millions. Uh, it's true that you can partition it, but still uh, it might be slow. So yeah, let me see, I might find some uh, this is basically what you what I want to be seeing. You know, when the when the splash happens, and here the all the yellow and the I think mostly the yellow and the green stuff uh, splashes out. You want them to collide with the base simulation. You want to have these waterfalls of stuff. I think here you can see it very clearly. So so there is waterfalls of of uh, debris which have uh, and which have been emitted from an edge and then they have collided with something and they, they are running off down the structure, creating these interesting shapes. Also, you can see it they, them in there. Um, these really kind, kind of fluid-like stuff is very nice to see. That's what we are aiming at. And a lot of times we can achieve it with bullet if it's a few thousand or when, when, when we um, are dealing with the bigger, with the bigger particles. And, uh, Sometimes, though, um, it's important to distinguish between the, the, the bigger ones and the smaller ones because, you know, in the bigger ones, it's important that you are dealing with the stuff with the with the size and the rotation of the particle. So when things hit, they want you want them to be rolling around and kind of um, kind of hitting other things and having size and uh, and so on. But when you want to have the, the tiny guys. You don't, you're not really concerned about how they are rotating. They usually just land like some spheres and some cubes, but just their amount, their, their sheer amount is, um, uh, is something which carries this, this fluid-like uh, effects. And for these things, we use uh, the, the SPH solver. And it's great because this is, uh, it, it's very fast and you know, it, it partitions very nicely. So, you know, if you want to really have a big bunch of, uh, of secondaries and you know debris 
uh, things like that, it's it's a it's a really good solution for your smallest for your smallest degree. Uh, now the problem with that is uh, that it's difficult becomes difficult to render because all of these things, you know, and uh, maybe some decent shapes on them becomes out out of place. So all of these things need to be instanced. Um, unfortunately, now as we render with uh, uh, with VRA, the instancing straight from thing in particles doesn't really work. Uh, the last time I checked, so what we do is that we uh, cache these um, secondaries to point clouds, and then we <coughs> uh, send them to Frost for instancing, and we do a bunch of Krakatoa uh, processing on top <coughs> to be able to control there. You know all the uh, lighting uh, characteristics, you know, sizes of these shapes, what kind of shapes uh, you use, uh, uh, all of this kind of stuff. You could do the same thing in particles. We have done this a few times. Um, it's just that with this, this thing now, I think um, it works. It works with, uh, nicer with very to go with on the through the through the frost route. So um, doesn't matter which way you you go th uh, you go through that. <laughs> it's important that you think. Uh, with the data in mind. Basically, you are creating information for lighting artists. What you're going to be seeing <clears throat> in your simulation is just some representation. And it's for a good reason that we have here stuff which, uh, which is just cubes. And these are cubes just because, you know, they're only collision shapes. We don't really care about, you know, um, what, they are, what their shape is in here. Because it doesn't really matter. It, it matters that they collide correctly, that they roll and the cube uh, or the sphere, but actually a cube is kind of faster to simulate because it has fewer polys. And also it, can, it tends to jump, to bounce around nicely. The, um, the sphere tends to be very, uh, you know, it rolls like a sphere, it doesn't bounce. So it, it, it moves very smooth, smoothly and the, the cube tends to just make this more interesting uh, bouncy uh, movements. But these are only collision shapes, and we uh, want to have as few polys as possible and uh, and a lot of particles. So we we keep in mind that we're creating data for the lighting artists, and we need to give them what they need to build something interesting from that. So uh, what we do is that we give them um, an initial position. So basically, when you create your secondaries. There is um, a data channel that you save the initial position to. So, you know, uh, I'm not sure for these guys where, where this is, I guess somewhere here. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't really have one, but uh, basically, you would you would expose some some custom data channel and uh, remember your position. So this is important because it allows you to afterwards seed some noise with some information which is continuous in space. Um, what this means is that your particles that are next to each other will gonna have similar values. If you use only your particle ID to see that noise, then they are going to have completely different values, you know, for all your particles. Sometimes this is what you need, sometimes it's not what you need, sometimes you need to have like variations in space that where in some area you have clusters of bigger stuff and in some areas you have clusters of smaller stuff. Uh, so so uh, to have uh, this kind of a rest frame, um, I think it's called Dikudini, is or initial position is very important to have as, a, as this data channel. Um, obviously, velocity is important for uh, motion blur, but also to dial some effects. Sometimes you want, let's say, you have some sparks or some kind of metal stuff, and we, you can use the velocity to mix the shader in a way that is becoming hotter when you have more velocity. And we just use the vertex uh, color channel for that. So when you save here the velocity, uh, then in the shader you can. Uh, use some Krakatoa uh, to send this to a color channel and then uh, use this as a vertex color map in the material editor to drive a color. Agent lifespan we also uh, save because 
there is um, sometimes there is popping that happens, especially when you go on to the streaming style of emission of particles. Um, and if you if you if you emit them, you know, over time, and then you are you, you kind of um, have something which uh, some which are a bit bigger. You can see that when they when they appear, they kind of pop into existence, you know, from nothing. So to solve that, you need to be able to, um, to control their their size. So so they kind of scale up smoothly in the first few frames of their existence, and then when they are about to die, they scale down first because before they die. And this is not something which is you know realistic in any way, but because this these are so many and so small. You don't really care about that. You care that they saturate these volumes, they 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 cover these surfaces. You know, you don't really care that they that they come in and they or they disappear. So yeah, we use H lifespan for scaling them. I guess something that we do in TP also quite often. Um, I'm not sure if we have it in here because it's more like a splashy event and it's not too long. But when you have longer emissions, it definitely happens a lot. Orientation, just to be able to rebuild uh, the, um, the orientation of the particle in, uh, when you send it to, to, to the instancer and radius, so you can uh, have some radius that is the one that you simulated with as a start point, but we often actually tweak these. Uh, and we can multiply it by something, for example, to make things bigger or smaller, depending on how, what kind of look we need, like more juicy or more sparse. So this IO debris secondary is that's kind of how it works. Um, I wanted to also show you kind of a setup that uses that. Um, and in here you can see that there is a let's see that I have loaded a bunch of secondary elements in here. And there is a, let's see if this will work. I don't know I have hidden all the geometry. Anyway. Uh, so there, so there is um, something which is loaded up in the ca in the cache, and um, there is uh, a magma which is multiplying the radius by something. So you know I can control the radius. Um, there is something which is coloring with using the velocity, as I said, uh, that we use to, to that. And then there is something which controls the spin because in this case we have this floating in the air uh, debris, and we want to to control their spin uh, more accurately in lighting. Uh, which is something that you know it's nice when the effects artist gives so much control to the lighting guys it's it the, you know makes things move much faster because the, the, these guys can kind of do the stuff in the in their viewport and i know you less about things which are you know not, not as significant and saves you recaching so yeah this is this is kind of helpful oh let me see Okay, uh, so then the other type of things that you do for secondaries is the volumetrics because obviously you have all of these uh, explosions and, and stuff going on. Oh, let me find. So when, so when we get to this area, usually we do the rigid bodies first and then We add in the um, the volumetrics. Uh, they are driven by the rigid bodies most of the time. Um, sometimes they are something which is kind of separate when it needs a very specific design. Um, they are very rarely something which influences the rigid bodies. Uh, you know, first. So uh, he's kept on first. So uh, to do to do this, it's either the same guy who is doing the rigid bodies when we have more time, but we have less time. It's um, it's parallel, so two different people are doing that. When this is the case, it's a very similar uh, process to uh, the what we do when the second when the debris happens, in the sense that you want to to to, to be you know thinking in a data uh, data kind of centric style, and most of the time the guy who is going to emit the secondaries is going to use think particles also, uh, but he's just going to load up your cache. Um, of the particles that you have emitted and um, 
emit from, from them emit some other particles. So what he needs from you is some kind of an interesting emission pattern. So you know some some nice um, areas that you know some nice conditions. So when stuff starts moving faster, it emits. When it, it, it becomes more slow, moving slower, or like things are smaller, they don't emit. So it's kind of an interesting emission pattern. Is what they need, and um, they need some age and some velo and velocity, obviously, because uh, the particles in input some velocity into the fluids and the age is useful to, to again fade in and out uh, these emitters so they don't they don't pop in which with, with the volumetric emission is quite unpleasant as long as you you you, you, you catch these things out then the <laughs> the other thing particles artist who is emitting uh, the uh, the fluids can take care of you know emission on their side usually this, these are quite simple yeah, this is just something which emits for you know a few frames. I'm not sure if this has. Uh, I think this doesn't yet have the these emission particles, but yeah, these are like something which lives for a few frames and um, basically their size and uh, the lifespan. If it's going to be like two or six frames, kind of is something which decides the the style of the emission, and the rest of it is the fluid. So. Quite straightforward from the point of view of the person who is uh, doing the rigid body effects. And now, when this is done, the last step of the process is to light everything. Now, this is far less trivial than it sounds. Um, as you have seen already above, there is a bunch of complications, and uh, it's good to be able to give lighting people a lot of information. Um, on the debris, as we saw, we have seen in the with the point clouds, also on the base geometry, uh, these areas that we find, that we think uh, the particles could improve a little bit in, you know, the control on the UVs and the textures, which um, uh, happen on the on the geometry. If we could paint some text, uh, we have better tools to paint some textures on specific areas that we could then uh, send to the shader. This would be quite welcome. Um, again, there's uh, we are we are kind of uh, a couple of versions behind. I think six point two four or something. What, what was it? So yeah, we're gonna upgrade soon. Hopefully, some nice surprise uh, above for us there. But um, generally, there's two ways of sending your base simulation to light. One of them is to have a send a TP cache. And the other one is to send a geometry cache, uh, usually an X mesh or a lambic. Uh, the TP cache has more control because the lighting person can influence it in ways that you can't do with simple geometry. You know, you can isolate uh, particle groups, you can uh, influence things uh, like the secondaries, uh, what we have seen before, or you can delete uh, some specific particles, or um, even like uh, have over material override per group. Uh, this kind of stuff. Actually, it's all now in the alembic export. I think uh, that I've seen from team particles into Katana. There is a nice per group control, which is quite good. But generally, <laughs> TP uh, cache has more control, but it's very often that the lighting artist does not feel comfortable enough with the particles. They, they, they think it's a bit, you know, too complicated for them. So um, uh, it's, it's often good to give them just um, um, a geometry cache. An expression on lambic. This has less um, less power to to you know to influence the lighting, but it has more. Uh, it's more straightforward. You know, you don't need extra um, software. You uh, you just load up the, the thing, and you know you, you hit render, and it shows up. Um, and there, the the main issue is the material assignment. So you need to make sure that you have plenty of control for the lighting people when they do material, their material assignments. If you do it with uh, thin particles, they, you, you have a one extra dynamic set which has per group material or material overrides. And if you do this with a geometry cache, you have um, uh, one big multi-sub material that is assigned to the geometry cache and it, it, it has slots that feed in all the, um, the nested materials and you uh, can override these because this is very important to do in uh, in lighting, <clears throat> you know, so as I said, you know, the secondaries are um, uh, these uh, 
point clouds which which get fed to a um, instancer and the volumetrics are just cache loggers. Uh, they mat with the uh, geometry and um, and they get some some shader work and some lighting work applied on them you know which is separate from the from the main geometry and eventually you generate this bunch of renders that you have uh, the geometry sometimes geometry without the mat if uh, there's some issues um, or you have a bunch of different shaders that the com people want to mix at different areas you know like some brighter and darker and um, different lights you know separate so they can you know tweak uh, how the lights uh, work and uh, build the final comp from that so that's basically our process you know i think that's what this will start i wanted to show you guys and i will upload this also um you know, just you know checklist is is useful is a useful thing um and i might make what i, what I really want to make is to get a, um, to strip down a couple of these scenes and use um, some of our own assets that we actually have right now you know in between projects you get some some downtime that you can uh, do some documentation work and you know some some educational work so what i'm going to be doing is that uh, to i'm going to apply these all of these um, techniques into some scenes that have our own assets in them and we can actually share and our assets don't look too bad actually at all you know uh, there is a house and there is a like a spacex falcon 9 rocket and stuff like that so um, ex uh, expect that to show up kind of soon and whichever questions you know might arise ask now or you know at any time i'm a bit too busy admittedly, admittedly these days so sometimes that i might miss out on some topics that that show up in the user group but if i do just message me with the link and i'm gonna show up and, and help out if nobody else has so, but usually these days there's there is a lot of very knowledgeable people and uh, uh, community helps out a lot which is, which is really great and that's something that i really want to uh, to be a part of and to to help out with uh, so many people have helped me when i was uh, learning these kind of things and i really want to do that for for the new guys so you know thanks everybody and uh just yeah please ask now or later or yeah yes the okay. floor is open to everyone catch it quick uh history is very busy thank you so much so much history this is great if you have your question please go ahead uh unmute yourself uh and ask uh, Juan says that it would be nice to know how you deal with with fluids. Yeah, this is obviously you know also one of my favorite uh, topics, but it is very expensive, and you know uh, it's going to be for for next time. But yeah, please remind me about that. Um, then let me see what else is there. Uh, Taryn says, do you prefer to use velocity scoping or actual collision impact to direct the, the initial impact? I prefer collisions because they look different um, what i have problems with the, with the velocity sculpting is that you don't get any decent spinning so let me let me let me paint here for a second if there is a there like your let's say your pieces are forming a surface like this um, if you hit them with something you get this nice bulge if you just uh, kind of velocity sculpt them you get these kind of stuff so the orientations are not the same as if you if you would hit them with something so i you i do the the velocity sculpting when i need very specific directions that the particles should fly at or like a, a very specific pattern so if you if you have some something like this but then the actor says okay nothing should should fly to the top to the uh, forward everything should fly to the sides so all the, the pieces should go like this and then there should be like nothing in here so this 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 I would do with the velocity sculpting, but then if I want to have some kind of more natural uh, impact of something that breaks through, you know, I would go with uh, with the with the uh, with the impact. That's a that's a nice question. Um, uh, I guess Hungarian dude, awesome name. 
says, can we elaborate on the first, uh, on, on the instancer? Um, I can. Um, let me do this, uh, this, uh, this, this cleanup and replacing of the assets with our own assets. And I will get tutorials about that. It's important. Uh, okay. To all the guys giving us compliments, thanks a lot. This means a lot. Uh, Cindy says, how long, how can you keep uh, with the friction to keep staying together as value? Uh, usually it's like in, in a couple of dozens, you know, like 10 or, or 20 or something like that. But depends all on the, on the scale of the scene. We tend to keep our scenes in a reasonable scale. So everything is, you know, there is always a tiny human there to kind of aid you with, uh, to assist you with uh, how big your scene is. And we tend to keep them at real scale. Uh, with the reasonable bodies, you know, we have found real scale is the best. So usually it's like, you know, a, a couple of dozen friction, uh, friction, um, Units. I don't know what you units like. Is lost? It lost for um, per per second. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, quite high with the friction. Much higher than what you usually do for like like air friction. Things like things like that. Um, Marcus asks, what are the specs of uh, the typical workstation? Um, we segment our machines in way we, in ways which workstations get uh, workstations and simulation machines get single CPU, single high frequency. CPU uh, setups. So this is much more efficient than a uh, dual CPU with lower frequency, uh, and you would get much faster simulations for like half of the money. So that's what we do. Uh, we just get like the, uh, the, the like recent i7 or, you know, Threadripper or something like this, but, you know, single CPUs, and you need quite, you need, you need plenty of memory. Forget you know at least sixty four gigs of memory you know now nowadays memory is kind of kind of pricey but you can fit a lot into sixty four gig loops the one twenty eight is you know even nicer uh, but yeah uh, single CPU high frequency is the, is the best bang for your buck. Uh, let um, me just jump in as well, Risa, if you allow me. This is Edwin of Cebus Visual Technology. Um, first really great uh, webinar you had here really great stuff and i'm thank you, thank always you. amazed about the workflows and uh, how users or how our community is using our tools so it's always great to see that <coughs> so excuse me for my voice i'm fighting a cold and i might cough you in, in the ears so I'm, I'm trying to avoid it <coughs> um, now um so yes you are right if you're looking um to do uh, particle or heavy particle based thing that's serialized then the single cpu is is the way to go the higher the frequency um the more speed you get however when you start adding um bullet and fluid and volume breaker uh, that is highly multi-threaded and we even enhance the multi-threading in our latest releases. So especially the fluid solver, um, it will use all the threads that, that are there. But um, it depends on, on the effects you're doing. And Bullet is uh, multi-threaded as well. Not everywhere. And Shape Collision is also multi-threaded, but only on the... Uh, collision part so um we are trying to get it more and more uh, multi-threaded but uh in general your your suggestion is is a really good one and, and straightforward it's for now still if you have a, a faster single cpu it's good for particle simulations awesome Eddie. thanks that's that, that, that's really great yeah it's awesome to to, to hear this from the source, that, that, that's very cool. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, so um, go ahead. There's some uh, more questions I can see there. So, just, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So a, a couple of guys asked about the, like why would you uh, do the, the 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 things on the detail on the on the edges and and what is the difference between these and uh, just having let's say uh, uh, just displacement with a, with a shape noise or, any, or or another way. So let me kind of again draw about this for a second. So let's say your original surface is like this, you know, uh, it, it's straight. And then let's say you display the surface and it becomes a surface like this. You know? But then um, this, this looks like a ridged surface. But if, let's say you, you put a bunch of particles on, on top, you get this. So there is, uh, 
there's kind of pits and crevices in here which you would never get from just people displacement. You know, in displacement, you can only see that it's the same surface that has been moved around and it does not have new things which are which are added like new geometry. So what we do is that we just add new geometry. And we have a lot of times, like let's say, if you look at it from the top, uh, because somebody asked what kind of shapes um, you use. So if you look at it from the top, um, if you imagine that there's like a, a concrete slab, which is like this, and there is a bunch of rebar sticking out from it, you know, kind of pretty much in all directions. Or and sometimes there is there is a couple of these clustered together, and like a rebar is moving through them, you know, like this. Um, or you know, there is like a big piece which is cut in the in in the middle, you know, like yeah, and the rebar is coming through, and then uh, there there is another piece, and you know, there is stuff like that. That's that's the kind of shape that we use. So now uh, the important question is that is about the, the orientation of these guys. So if you use like a flat slab like this, let's say, let's say if you, if you look at this from the side and it looks like that. This makes it very important to orient it correctly. So sometimes if you do things like flat roofs or, you know, things that you can easily figure out the orientation of, these are nice. But other times when you have something, things which are not flat roofs, you know, and you you get some uh, orientation gives you trouble, just don't use flat pieces. Use more like, yeah, like, you know, like deformed spherical things. And these you can, you can place anywhere and they just place them on the edges and they will just work. You know, of course, not always they work, you know, extremely well, sometimes it's a bit too obvious when these ends and when this starts, like like here, you know. But a lot of times, when you when you place the the, the smaller particles near that surface, it works very well. So that's kind of my preferred method of um, of getting a, a lot of uh, a lot of that going on. Of course, this costs a lot of geometry, so it's an expensive method. But it's kind of the only thing which works really. So um, yeah, for the for where we really want to have detail added, that's what we use. I hope that helps. Let me just go back a little bit. People were asking about what to use for, with the volumes. Yeah, if it's from FX or Phoenix, it's mostly from FX. Um, yeah, I, I answered um, Martin's question. Particle skinning. Uh, particle skinning is, uh, Eduardo asks about particle skinning. It's really interesting and I really wanna uh, do more of that. I, I think I know that now in the in the new update, we're gonna get a skinner, which we will start with. I think we're gonna take right out when we have to. Uh, but what I was referring to in here was not skinning really, but just the original, uh, mesh is actually pre-fractured pre and you pre-attach the pieces to to this cage that you have simulated already and eventually when at some point you want to release them you just send them to another group which is giving them gravity and shape collision and the rest of the uh, of the of the particles which are which are still attached they are neutron relative to these released particles so that's, that's how we use, we use them. And you know, the, the cool thing about this is that you can have these different islands uh, that you simulate separately. And because all of them follow the same cage, you can get all, the, all your resolution uh, into one of these islands. And, and, and this way you can focus, you, know, you can create eventually your shot as a patchwork of several simulations. And each one of these simulations has focused all your resources and at only a single place. And the whole thing looks as a result much more detailed than it would look if you just put on one simulation. Okay, hopefully this gives us answer to that. Um, uh, he, uh, Terry asks about how to transition from one solver to the next test and flow, for example. So they, they don't interact. Um, and I think uh, what we do is that we benefit from that they, they're not interacting because you don't want the smaller stuff to influence the big stuff. Like the big stuff is there to set up the um, the character and you want to preserve that character and enrich it with the small stuff. Uh, in situations, if you want to have small stuff actually moving the big stuff, they will be part of the main simulation. So that's that's what we usually do. Um, in flow, there is uh, 
uh, the the SC the, uh, the SC groups is part of the boundary uh, of the boundary there. Okay. It would have been nice to have OpenCL or could it help for SIMS in the future? Uh, says Juan, and this is a question to Edwin, uh, which is the same hopes on my side, but I know, I know, you know, threading simulations is extremely kind of conceptually difficult. So I'm not holding my, my breath for that. You know, I know people are uh, working a lot on this, but uh, we know that it's, it's difficult. Um, Don Christopher says he's a beginner, which is great. It's awesome to have the new guys coming in. Uh, great to have you in here. Um, about the great book, uh, When Learning Effects. Um, there was not many books when I was growing up and lately I've been reading mostly like other types of books. There is, um, I think the best, the, what I did was learning the forums. So you get together with like-minded people who are in kind of your stage and people who are a bit more advanced, they help you out and then you learn. I think it's a fantastic way. And um, it's basically the thing that we are doing right now. It's really great. Uh, about online courses, um, I, I'm not sure. I, I really, I mean, this is a sensitive question. I, um, we, our, our business is not education, so the stuff, training stuff we do, we do for free. And I'm sure there's, there's interesting schools there. I know people who are from, you know, some of the schools which are really quite good, but don't feel comfortable enough to endorse anybody. Yet. I haven't thought about it enough. Um, he, he, you ask if uh, there, there are some people that, who say that you have to be smart in math. Um, I think this is a, is a great advice. Just not being scared about numbers and thinking about things in a slightly, you know, being comfortable with, you know, kind of normal life things and like where zero is and where one is and be able to imagine these things are really useful. And it's, it is math which is so basic that, you know, things in, it's not high school math even. This is like, you know, seventh grade math. So if you're missing this part of your education, you go to Khan Academy that you can learn this stuff for free. It's really great, uh, great explanation. And that's something I, I stand behind a lot. I donate, so they translate to more languages. Uh, their, their math education is really simple and to the point and really, really nicely uh, presented. Uh, Chiliba said he started scripting when he was 42. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, um, scripting is, is, is really helpful when you have to deal with a big bunch of, of you know, things that you need to kind of mass manipulate. Um, not many ways around that. So it really helps. And again, nowadays with Python, it's much easier than it used to be. Um, okay. Then there's questions, Priyash just questions, questions about uh, how to effectively handle a lot of geometry. Let's discuss this in another way, because the, in, other, in another session, because this is quite a deep, deep question. Um, but please remind me and let's, let's have that talk. Okay. If you can only do addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, that's a lot of times enough. It just, it's not about, you know, it's about him being able to imagine and to, and to think with these things, you know, in a way that you're comfortable with. If you, uh, if you do stuff with, with TP and with, you know, the, the, the similar plat platforms, it's, uh, you'll, you'll get comfortable, don't worry. Um, and okay. also, let me just jump in for the math thing. Uh, also, one uh, important concept is just a little bit of vector math. So vectors are very important. And they also sound scary. And um, in school, when I remember, uh, vector uh, was really a scary thing. And the teacher had really a lot of fun to torture us and uh, to scare us away from this. Um, but later, if you, if you relax and just look at it, it's, it's so simple. It's, it's just a way of describing how um, directions are uh, behaving. And if you have multiple vectors, where do they point? So um, it's not that complicated. It's just more about people want to scare you and keep the secret. But uh, you can learn all this. So there's nothing really uh, dramatic about it. Okay, back to you, Riz. 
<laughs> yeah, I absolutely, absolutely agree. Uh, it's, th- th- these, are, these are important and, and, and very easy uh, because they're very intuitive. They have so much like real world um, applications that you, can, that you can easily imagine them as, you know, like whatever arrows or your hands. Um, it's, it's, it's quite easy. Um, so uh, Terry asks, like if, you, if it was li- large water moving ship, uh, ship collision debris, how much do you rely on friction as opposed to joints? So yeah, in this, in, um, with, with friction, the limitation, the, the, the benefit is that it's very simple to set up. The, the disadvantage is that it's, it's much more limited because it's only keeping things in place. Joints will keep things together and not necessarily in place. So the friction way we use when, when you, we, are, we are breaking up something which is not moving. And then, then joints are useful when you want to have something which is moving and is like gradually breaking apart and a lot of its components stay together. So then it's much more, it, it makes more sense to, to the joints. Uh, and the, they also transfer velocity in a, in a nicer way. You can, you can say basically across what, what distance you create the joints. So you know how much velocity gets transferred. So whenever you want to have a bit more you know, involved in interesting behavior, you, you use joints. But whenever, if you have a situation where like something is like this building in here, it was just standing in place and you need to push it, to push it through, you know, to push it around, then, then the, the friction approach is, is super easy to, to set up and, and to tweak and very fast to sim. so. Yeah, and, and the important part here is you're using friction per particle. So what it mm-hmm. actually is, it's just a, a velocity or speed multiplier per particle. So what Risto did here is, is pretty um, sneaky. Um, he is controlling the friction per individual particle. So um, what it does, it just multiplies the, the velocity up and down per particle. Um, I find it interesting. I wouldn't do it that way, but um, it's it's a great approach because I can see how much freedom it, it can present to you because you can now do whatever procedural approach to your friction. You can say a big object has more friction or less friction or the friction increases with the speed or the color or temperature or whatever. So uh, I I understand um, that this can be a really um, creative way to get some um, interesting uh, movement into uh, a whole chaos, chaotic particle cloud. Uh, cool. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, things. Some things come up. You know, some ideas come up when you when you when you work around the problem, which would not come up otherwise. So it's uh, it's an interesting kind of emergent solutions to uh, to problems, and and you find out the, the the approaches which are kind of productive and and uh, are directable and and you know uh, practical. So yeah. Okay. Cedar um, um, says, uh, what new feature uh, can be used for this destruction scene? I would say I really want to, to, to um, get stuff that is, or, yeah, surface force is awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that because uh, interesting way, uh, like uh, approachable way to design uh, fields, but definitely I would like to get the, the APF uh, to, uh, worked out more in here because you know we have been on projects for a long time and we were not able to upgrade because we kind of lock into onto a version during the project. But you know now that the project is over, we're going to upgrade soon. But also, I'm excited about the procedural booleans so, because they will be able to to kind of eat up some some geometry in an, in, in a way which is going to give it more detail and then also the uh, the Skinner. So this, this would be very interesting. I think they would help out a lot. Yeah, don't change the learning system. I mean, it's always uh, running, you know, conditionally. <laughs> some things are, are, are going great, some things are problematic. But definitely, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you want to limit the, the new variables in the system. Um, Jonathan asks if I have been learning some physics theory how fire and smoke work in real life. Um, 
I would say thermodynamics <laughs> is very useful, but like just to understand the world, you know, not in a, you could, you could kind of, you could kind of read about the way that the, the very kind of layman's terms, uh, things described in, in, in very approachable uh, context without too much of the you know, differential, uh, without doing differential math in your, in your head. And kind of as long as you get the, the, uh, the connections and the dependencies, you know, the, uh, the, the, what is proportional to what, I think you're going to be fine. It gives you interesting insights about things. So these things are very, uh, definitely helpful, but you definitely don't need to do the you know differential math. math you know uh, that's why we have Edwin, who has done this uh, this really good you know work. So we can uh, kind of just artistically design things and uh, uh, like, like sleep more at night, hopefully. Um, and the other question was. Moving for, from lower sims to higher sims and keep the art direction. I think um, a lot of what I was saying um, what is kind of is doing that. Um, a lot of it is about keeping the same geometry and enriching it with extra stuff on the uh, on the edges. Um, some of it, a lot of it is about having this geometry, this uh, earlier layer, big geometry. Uh, colliding with the with the next layers and pushing them around, which is also preserving the, that behavior. So you know these kind of things. Um, do, do we do any lighting? Um, we, I mean, any lighting is a is a heavy term. So the way that we do it is that we have all of all of our lights in light select elements, and we have a bunch of um, normals. Uh, and uh, in, world, in, in both world space and object space and the positions. <coughs> Sorry. So, <coughs> so we do, we use these normals to create masks that you can see, you know, top left corner, uh, top right corner, bottom left, bottom right corner, or some, some certain, if, if you use camera space or if you use uh, world space, you know, so certain areas which face in a certain direction. And we can use these for masks to, to uh, make the lights there stronger or weaker. So basically, use this kind of localized light mixing. Um, so if this, is a, if this qualifies as a lighting, I think, you know, then yes. Yeah. Uh, we don't really, we can't really move the lights in comp yet, um, but uh, this, this is pretty much um, very functional. And uh, most of the lighting in the beauty pass is, <laughs> its, its goal is to, to paint as much detail you know light, light and shadow in the in the scene and then um in comp you kind of balance out these lights and and color them and and so on but by basically in lighting you create these spatial variation so then you can in comp uh, balance that and and kind of bring out the the best stuff that you that you need to you know to bring out okay so yeah, uh, I will post up the the outline um, in the in the group right now, and eventually uh, who knows make something uh, bigger out of it. Actually, this is the plan: make something bigger out of it where it has scenes and everything. Uh, it's it, it's a great it will be, it will be a good training material for people who start up in our company also, and, and just get it out there in <laughs> public for free will be will be useful. I hope. Okay, let me just jump in again. So you're losing your voice slowly. So I, I think oh, yeah. we, yeah, it's we been a uh, wrap this up. You, <laughs> you were talking now uh, straight for one and a half hour. Um, so uh, once again, thank you so much that you did that. Uh, very informative and very uh, interesting things. Um, Thanks for doing that. And uh, we are wrapping this up now. So uh, thanks everyone for coming in and, and watching this uh, webinar. And I wish you a nice Halloween tonight. <coughs> Goodbye. Uh, thank you guys for having me. It's been amazing. And um, whatever questions uh, are standing out, please ask them in the group and I'm gonna answer everything. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. <laughs>